join. Joining, joining, joining. Cool. All right. Can everyone hear me? Uh huh. Okay. Awesome source. Welcome back, guys. Um, as I said last time, um, probably every second week, I'm going to try and get around to every week. Uh, wow. Okay. We've got quite a few people joined today. Awesome. Okay. So let us take it away with the class and start the party. Okay, cool. So continuing on from where we were last week with the Afrotherians. How's everyone doing this week? Everyone good? You can open up the chat room if you want and you can ask questions. Um, I'm not actually sure. There we go. There's a chat function there. If anyone's good, um, you can send messages in the chat. Otherwise, we will continue as it is. Okay, cool. So the book of the week is Neil deGrasse Tyson's Astrophysics for People in a Hurry. Sounds difficult, actually takes a lot of really difficult concepts and explains them in a layman way that makes it simple even for high schoolers. Really interesting book, thoroughly entertaining, written for the average Joe, and it makes the universe understandable for people. So uh, I have a I have the ebook of this on my Kindle. Um, I want to get a hard copy as well. It's absolutely brilliant. I recommend anyone read it. Okay, cool. So uh, recapping Afrotherians, I don't have to say it again, but we'll say it again. Um, Afrotherians are those animals that originated on the isolated continent of Africa. So Africa was isolated for quite a few million years and for well over 30 million years. And um, because of this, um, a variety of organisms evolved because they had no competition from, from, um, from Asia, from the Americas, from Australasia, from Europe. Well, Europe didn't really exist at that time, but we'll get into those details later. So currently there are two recognized clades of Afrotherians, the one being the Pangulata, which are elephants, stussies, dugongs, and manatees. We covered them in the last two lessons. And the final lessons today, we'll be doing the Afro Insectophila which are literally the African insect lovers. Okay, so the African insect lovers are broken into three different orders. The Afrosauricidae, uh, Afro the Macrosclerodea, and the Tubula dentata. Big words. Um, you don't have to learn the big fancy words as always. I like to learn them because um, it's just good to learn them, I guess. Um, make sure you keep up to date with um, the academic world. And, uh, oh, we've got a question. There we go. Uh, we have load shedding from 7 to 9.30. Okay, I'll upload them to YouTube when I get a chance. Okay, so Afroscoricidae Afro, uh, are golden moles and their cousins. Um, the Macroscoridae are the elephant shrews and the tubular dentata is only one individual, the artfark. So they're all related, they're all insect lovers. So moving on. So Afrotheria and Afro Insectophila in particular have only recently been recognized as, as related species. In 1998, that's how recently, 22 years ago, that's only when genetic studies finally caught up and they were able to identify them as being completely unrelated to pretty much everything else that they thought they were related. They used to lump um, golden moles, moles, elephant shrews, shrews, uh, art fox, pangolins all together and they realize actually no they're completely unrelated the genetics just don't line up uh, so there might be some physiological similarities but um, that happens to just be a case of convergent evolution um, whereas the genetics actually show that they're completely unrelated you and Mao Zedong might look very similar but you're not cousins um, you just happen to look similar but you're not actually cousins. I'm going to put you on mute I don't know who's going through but there's a couple of people all right, so um, this was due to insufficient fossil discoveries and previously insufficient genetic discoveries. The technology just wasn't there. Now we have the technology for the last 20 years, so I'm going to put the fan off. It's probably making a hell of a noise. And um, it's, we now have the, the correct equipment or updated equipment that gives us accurate genetic studies. And um, there's very limited um, fossils and physiological um, similarities between these species but the genetics don't lie. They show that they are related. And um, this has been the final nail in the coffin for a lot of the old science that was thrown out the window and they've reclassified things in the last 20 odd years. Uh, 
So stuff that you might have learned in school, even stuff that uh, when I was studying previously, so I was learning stuff that was written in the 80s and 90s, and it seemed up to date, but actually it's been scrapped. So maybe older generations have never heard of Afrotheria, um, but these guys are all related. So Afrotherians have some similarities. They have higher than average vertebral counts compared to Lorys and Therians and primates and those guys. Uh, the, pla the placenta forms in a very similar way, quite different to how a lot of other mammals form, placental mammals. They all have similar ankle structure, which actually links them up with the Xenotherians from South America. And um, they have late permanent dentition. So they only get their de permanent dentition much later in life. Uh, a lot of animals get them very young, six months, a year at most. Primates tend to get them a little bit later too, but the Afrotherians get much later in life, often only when they're adults. And many species, coincidentally, have elongated mobile snouts used to find or manipulate food, just like an elephant, just like an elephant shrew, just like an aardvark. So um, this goes back again to the, the, the Eocene 50 odd million years ago when Africa was isolated from the rest of the world. Australia was as well, as was South America. So you had these individual land masses that had no real connection with each other and things were not able to interconnect. So you had these completely isolated ecosystems forming and a lot of convergent evolution. So these ecological gaps existed, um, the conditions were there, and because of that, similar things evolved. Australia, for example, being very similar to South Africa in many ways, well, similar to Africa, not South Africa. <laughs> Um, and I'll explain to you, um, there's a lot of geological similarities, but we won't get into all the details. Apart from the fact that they used to be connected in terms of where they are on the planet, they share a lot of the same sort of currents. The, um, the geology is the same, the ecological conditions are the same, the climates are the same. So despite the apparent differences in both regions, Africa and Australia have more things in common than one would realize. They're climatically and geographically similar, and historically they were both geographically isolated large land masses with a eastern current and a western current, creating similar conditions on west coast and similar conditions on east coast with a central plateau. So they have a lot of things in common, uh, ignoring the trees and ignoring the specific animals. The, the, the ecological conditions were quite similar. So they actually produced quite a lot of animals, a lot more animals than you'd realize um, that actually were similar. So there's similar conditions led to e uh, similar ecological conditions and thus a range of convergent evolutionary events between completely unrelated species. Remember, convergent evolution does not necessarily occur at the same time. So it doesn't have to be the same time. It rather leads to similar results. A very common example that I've used many, many times are sharks, dolphins, and ichthyosaurs. Ichthyosaurs existed 200 million years ago. Sharks and dolphins live today, but yet ecologically and physiologically, they look very similar because the ecological conditions were the same. So we have, that's strange, the picture's not shown. Uh, we have a long-nosed bandicoot. Okay, I don't know why these other pictures were not appearing. They appeared, there may be something wrong with the, PD, with the PPT. Um, okay, over here we have a long-nosed bandicoot, which is a moss super from Australia, and the golden rump elephant shrew from Africa. Um, I'm not sure why the picture is not showing. And the fantail donut and the short-snouted elephant shrew, again, almost identical, but uh, completely unrelated. The one's a placental, and the other is a marsupial, this being the marsupial here. You'll see them later in the presentation, and you'll see how similar they are. So these guys are marsupials. Uh, the pictures that are not showing are the placental, for some reason they're not showing, I apologize. Okay, and again, Australia up until very recently was substantially larger, okay? This is the Australian plateau and Tasmania, all these areas of Indonesia, all connected with each other. And right now they're below the water line, but um, during glaciation events, the water levels of the ocean, uh, ocean's water levels drop about hundred meters. And you have this large supercontinent forming, whereas um, at the moment, because of rising ocean levels, all these areas are broken up because they're in lower lying areas. So Australia is quite a bit smaller. Okay, and Africa as well at the moment is also breaking up into different continents. So we're having the, 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 the Great Rift Valley, which is actually breaking apart. It's also pushing into the Red Sea uh, Rift. Uh, the Cameroon Rift is also splitting apart. So we can expect in the next 11 million years, Africa will probably be two or maybe even three separate continents. And they will be geographically isolated, which will get other organisms evolving. 
So that's down the line. We won't be there for that 11 million years from now. There's no way humans are going to be around. We will wipe ourselves out. Um, so, but nevertheless, Africa or what is Africa will endure. A little interesting story about ecological behavior is, um, you know, we all know what an acacia is if you're from Africa. We now call them Vachelias and Senegalias. They tend to be thorny in the old world, Africa and Asia. And this is an adaptation to the high number of ruminant browsers and elephanted mega browsers. So a lot of the damage is... Okay. So this is an adaptation to the large, large number of browsers. Australia doesn't have a high number of browsers. It's got some browsers, but certainly not a large number of them. And they're certainly not doing large amounts of damage. So ecologically, there's been no pressure on the acacias in Australia to grow thorns. In fact, having thorns is a hindrance because you're waiting for waiting photosynthesis, photosynthesis and you're wasting your time in terms of growth because you're developing all these defense mechanisms for no reason. So natural selection has favored acacias that have developed fewer and fewer thorns and Australian acacias do not have thorns today. Any that do have thorns get outcompeted by the ones that don't have thorns because they just grow faster. So even the uh, recently extinct Diprotodon, which is a two and a half ton wombat, um, they were more reliant on grass species. Uh, uh, kangaroos and wallabies tend to also focus on grasses. Some do browse, but certainly not to the extent that kuzus, uh, inyalas, uh, elephants, you know, um, go to town on, on these poor trees over here. Okay, so we're going to be talking about um, the first group of um, Afrotherians, uh, the insectophilas, which are the Afroscoridians, which are golden moles, otters, otter shrews, and tenrex. And all species are found only in sub Saharan Africa, okay, and in Madagascar. So there are three families, all geographically isolated the golden moles, which are limited to southern Africa, otter shrews, which are limited to central Africa, and the tenrex, only found in Madagascar. So these are the three groups here. These are the uh, otter shrews found in this area over here, golden moles found here, and tenrex found over here. And they all look very, very different. So the first are the golden moles. No way related to true moles, which come from North America and Europe and Asia. Uh, they just happen to be very similar. In fact, in many ways, they look more similar to the Australian marsupial moles, which I showed in the very first lectures about mammals. Um, and again, ecologically very similar and have adapted to a desert-like environment, a lot of the species, just like the Australian marsupial moles, which have also adapted to desert-like environments, whereas gold, uh, the true moles from Europe tend to be more temperate in their own habitat. And here's the, jaw, the, the, the head over here. As you can see, very underdeveloped eyes, very underdeveloped skull, very small cranium, quite robust, uh, quite a long uh, rostrum, again, a very good sense of smell, and sharp needle-like teeth with almost no um, molars, because they're, they're mostly eating invertebrates, a lot of insects, a lot of earthworms, um, and most of the stuff they're eating is actually doesn't really need to be ground down. You need to bite through that, that uh, keratinous sh shell and go to town. So they have tend to have very needle-like teeth, you know, like a lot of insectivorous animals. So golden moles are endemic to Southern Africa. They are not related to true moles. Golden moles have long coiled cochlea, part of the in ear, indicating that they're actually adapted to hearing low frequency sound vibration. So they hear very, very low frequencies to the ground um, and they're actually very good at hearing, even though most of the ear is internal. They only have small little dots um, where, you can, where you can actually see the ear. They are no real um, external ears. And they're solitary with males aggressively defending their territories from other males. So they're not all very cute and adorable, but they're violent little buggers. So there are 21 species in nine genera. 11 species are critically endangered, bordering on extinct. Uh, most of that is due to urbanization because a lot of the areas of these animals occur are actually in areas that have now been taken over by people. Someone's phone is making noise. I'm just going to see who it is. Um, I don't know who that is. Okay, so all species are limited in their distribution because they're very habitat specific. And um, also mining is a major cause because a lot of the areas of these animals do occur on areas that are constantly hammered by mining. 
So 11 of the species are critically endangered. One of the most beautiful and completely adapted to a desert-like environment, they don't actually make burrows because you can't burrow in desert sand, it just collapses behind you. So they're more swim through the sand like a fish, is Grant's golden mole. Beautiful little guy over here. As you can see, absolutely no eyes. The eyes are completely vestigial and below the skin, they have no function. And you can't actually see the ears on the surface. They are there, but they're very, very small. The Cape Golden Mole, truly beautiful, um, also quite common in the Cape, often found when people uh, get killed by people's cats and dogs. And the rough-haired Golden Mole from the Transvaal area over here, which is also quite a cute little guy, but a lot shaggier and a lot I don't know, fluffier in my opinion. And they're all adapted to their own little conditions. As you can see, his, his fingers are fused together to be these digging like little troughs, um, and they're adapted to you're living in a subterranean environment. They don't do well on the surface and they certainly don't do well in captivity. So people think they're cute, but they're not pets. Otter shrews, something really weird. Um, I've never seen one in my entire life because I've never really had the good fortune of working in Central Africa. Most people don't know these animals exist, okay? Um, they range in size. Um, the largest gets about 60 centimeters long and they are semi-aquatic with numerous adaptations to water conditions, thick, impermeable coats, just like otters chew themselves. They have, a, they have a layer of fat, they have rudder-like tails, uh, they have um, reduced eyes, and um, they actually swim through the water just like a crocodile, using their tail like a rudder. And they're extremely secretive and very. there are very, very few records of living specimens being found because most of the areas that occur are deep in the jungle um, in Central Africa, and you're not gonna find them hanging around. Most of them are killed and eaten by, by local communities. And um, they are threatened in any areas that humans tend to find them. So there are three known species uh, in two genera. The largest is the giant otter shrew over here. As I said, I couldn't really get any good photos of them alive. They don't really tend to be found alive. But you can see over here, almost like a, um, again, like an otter-like tail um, and a very, very hairy appearance with short reduced legs because they don't use them for, for, for um, climbing or jumping. They mostly swim and they tend to live along riverbanks, just like otters. And again, they have a very similar diet. They catch fish, they catch invertebrates, um, they eat everything from snails through the freshwater clams, through to little guppies, whatever they can get their hands on. Tenrex, not hedgehogs. I know people seem to think they're hedgehogs. And for a very long time, until even the early 2000s, they were classified as cousins of hedgehogs. And then genetically, we realized they were actually cousins of elephants. Weird. So, Tenrex uh, also very needle-like teeth, but because they tend to have, a lot of them tend to have an omnivorous diet, they have more pronounced molars. Um, they are, for the most part, insectivorous, but a lot of them are omnivores. And they're an extremely diverse group, just like rodents, just like the marsupials. And numerous species resemble shrews, true shrews, not elephant shrews, hedgehogs, and rodents. And they're found in every environment in Madagascar with the highest diversity living in tropical rainforests. Okay, so they're only found in Madagascar. Uh, we know the hedgehog tenrec, which looks like a hedgehog. Um, and they only get their permanent teeth when they achieve adult size. So imagine growing to my age and then only getting your permanent teeth then. So it's something unique amongst the tenrecs. And there are 31 known species. So 31 species on the whole of Madagascar is quite a lot. People don't realize how diverse Madagascar actually is. Uh, the web-footed tenrec, which looks quite rodent-like and is, again, much like otter shrews, highly adapted to a semi-aquatic life and has a very similar lifestyle to the otter shrew. The greater hedgehog tenrec looks very similar to a hedgehog. In fact, you'd have a hard time telling them apart. Again, in no way related to hedgehogs, hedgehogs are more related to carnivores, actually, believe it or not, um, in terms of distant relatives. And of course, the mole-like tenric, which looks very similar to an actual shrew, but again, is in no way related to an actual shrew. So elephant shrews, um, people often think they have tusks, but they don't have tusks. I've seen lots of these little photoshops going around. They are often, know, they're now known as Sengis throughout Africa. And I actually prefer the name Sengi. Um, this is the largest over here. So this is why they're called elephant shrews, not because of tusks, but they have a long, a long, flexible snout that they can use for actually sniffing in the dirt. And again, the actual face is quite robust, almost like rodent-like. And they've got these incisors, these canines, indicating they have a more of a predatorial diet. Some of them do actively hunt. Uh, and again, they have that carnosal shear, indicating that they are eating larger items. So shrews 
are not elephant shrews. This is a true shrew over here. These are Uliophyta. Again, they are related to true hedgehogs, uh, and they are distant cousins of carnivores, believe it or not, and bats. So shrews are found in Africa, but the greatest diversity is found throughout the Northern Hemisphere. We only have a, uh, a, a trickle of true shrews in Africa. So here's some fantastic convergent evolution. So we have Uliophyta, which are related to carnivores, ruminants, equines, etc., and they've produced shrews, true moles, and hedgehogs. And this is what I find amazing over here. Then you have the Afro insectophila, which are related to elephants, hyraxes, and dugongs, and they produce the elephant shrews, otherwise sengis, golden moles, and ten rocks, ten rocks, which look like hedgehogs. And that is absolutely amazing that you're literally producing similar looking orders in completely relate, unrelated mammals. Um, Uliophyta evolved in the Northern Hemisphere. We do get them now in the Southern Hemisphere, but they evolved in the Northern Hemisphere and they produce shrews, true moles and hedgehogs, Afroinsectivala and produced shrews, elephant shrews, golden moles and tenrex. Incredible, absolutely incredible. It's not even just one organism, it's like whole orders being recreated. And that's the thing, that's the powerful force of convergent evolution. Nature is extremely lazy. And if it finds a design, it's not going to, you know, it just tends to go back to the same sort of design over and over and over because it's the most efficient thing. And any, any sort of deviation from that tends to get weeded out. And given enough millions of years, you'll tend to produce similar looking organisms. Given enough, uh, even if you go back 50 million years ago, we talked about it with whales. And Pachycetus was a mammal that looked very crocodilian in appearance because for its environment, a predatorial freshwater mammal being crocodilian in appearance was the most effective form of living. Uh, most, it was the most effective form for a, for a mammal to take. And um, again, we see this starting to pop up in, in some of the, even the freshwater dolphins that are popping up today. Anyway, I'm deviating. Okay, so Sengis are elephant shrews, and I prefer the name Sengi because it actually doesn't confuse people with shrews. It, it's an unrelated organism, it's its own thing, and actually it was um, Jonathan Kingdon in 1997, I think he said that um, we should rather start calling them elephant, uh, calling elephant shrews Sengis instead because of the confusion, and also it's an African word and we should just be using it because they are completely and only found in Africa. So we should use the word Sengi, so I'm going to use the word Sengi going forward. So all Sengi species are found in Africa. While most species are strictly insectivorous, some have been observed eating fruit and leaves, especially the larger ones. They found that they eat a lot more fruit in their diet. Sengis, compared to a lot of other small animals, tend to have large brains in comparison to their side. size. Sengi females are one of the few non-primates to menstruate, um, fruit bats being the only other mammal that menstruates as far as that I know of, um, and obviously primates do as well humans, uh, orangutans, bonobos, chimpanzees, gorillas, they all do. Okay, and unlike true shrews, sengis are long-legged and forage over land rather than hiding below litter and vegetation. So true shrews tend to stick below leaf litter, forage in there, never really expose themselves to the light. A lot of the larger sengis are quite comfortable coming out in the open and foraging through in open, open land and bouncing around and doing their thing. Compared to true shrews, they also have rather good eyesight and an exceptional sense of smell. They have slightly meta lower metabolisms. Some of the shrew species can starve to death in a few hours. Sengis can go a few days without dying, most of the species. And here's the difference. They're typically monogamous, but some of them live in small communities. They'll live in their monogamous pairs within communities, but they tend to all be monogamous. So Sengis are known from 20 species around the world. Um, the gold, again, I apologize for my pictures. I'm not sure why they're not saving. The golden rump sempi, which is the one I showed you initially, this guy over here. Uh, there we go. Okay. Obviously a compatibility issue. The cape sengi over here, found throughout the cape. Really adorable little fellow. And the four turn king sengi, um, which is found in Central Africa. Really cute little guy. Looks a bit like a bandicoot actually from Australia. Again, some convergent evolution. Similar behavior to a bandicoot as well. So the last group we're gonna be talking about today are tubular dentata. It only has one animal, and I think we all know it and we all love it. The artfark. There's only one species in this order, the artfark. Artfarks are unique as in that their teeth lack enamel. All mammals have enamel. And they can, these teeth continue to grow throughout their lives and are tubular in structure. So they have, they're made up of dentine, which is what the inside of the tooth is actually made up of. 
And they continue to grow through their life, much like a conveyor belt, very similar to rodents, except that rodents are capped with enamel and the enamel is constantly growing. So artifacts lose their milk teeth before they are born. So they're born with their adult teeth. Um, I want to find this picture, weird. Okay, I apologize to the pictures are not loading. Uh, there's a very nice picture over here. I'll see if I can upload it on the YouTube video of uh, the dentine structure of an, of an art fork. Again, it's not uploading. So art fox feed, uh, feed mainly on ants and termites, myrmecophagy, that's the big fancy word. Um, ants and termites are not actually related. Everyone seems to think they're related, even though they use the word white ant, which drives me crazy. Termites are not white ants, they're termites. Ants are related to bees and wasps, hymenoptera, and termites are actually descendants of cockroaches of the order Blattodea, suborder Isoptera. Isoptera used to be its own order, but they've now lumped it under the order of Blattodea, which are cockroaches. So next time someone says, um, oh, it's a white ant, actually say, sorry, it's just it's basically a communal cockroach. <laughs> Fun fact. Uh, a single art fork can actually consume up to 50,000 termites in one night. Uh, and can dig a meter long burrow in five minutes. That is weaponized impressiveness. That's incredible. Uh, they are little walking tanks, incredible animals. So contrary to popular opinions, carnivores, sorry, uh, art fox are actually omnivores and consume art fox cucumbers. Again, there's supposed to be a picture here, a compatibility issue obviously with my PPD player. And um, I'll try to get a picture for you guys later next lesson. So you get these art fox cucumbers, which are these cucumbers that grow below the ground. Art fox dig them up, crush them up, uh, defecate out the seeds, and the seeds actually grow in the in the the art fox feces. So they are completely reliant on art fox. It's a form of cucumber. It's also known as an art art fox pumpkin, but it is a form of cucumber that grows in a subterranean condition. So art fox are extremely important. They're not just cute. Uh, they're important control agents of ants and termites, and they are ecosystem engineers. I'm sure any of you that have done guiding training will know this term. And they create burrows in extremely hard ground, facilitating the survival of other species. In this reserve, we definitely have no art fox. I've seen no evidence of them, uh, which would probably um, be one of the reasons why we have so few, um, few warthogs in Tula Tula, because um, in this sort of terrain, it's extremely hard soil and, and a warthog would have a hard time digging this type of terrain. So he would have a hard time finding a burrow and thus surviving. Um, because of the absence of art fox, um, they, they, you know, there's just not a high enough abundance of warthogs on this reserve. And um, in arid areas like the Karoo, they're actually an extremely important food source for larger predators like leopards and hyenas, uh, because there are just very few browsers and grazers, and they're actually fairly easy to catch. They're not very bright, and they're quite easy to catch. And they're converting all that insect-like uh, protein into mammal protein, which, of course, these hyenas and leopards can take on. So last little thing we're going to talk about today is the African-Asian interchange. During the Cenozoic era, about 26 million years ago, Africa finally connected with the Asian mainland. This allowed for lower Asian therians to migrate into the new, newly exposed Africa. And these include all our modern carnivores, which outcompeted the African carnivores. So lions, leopards, hyenas, they're not from Africa. They came from Asia, or their ancestors came from Asia. Artiodactylans, or the ruminants that we know and love, giraffes, again, their ancestors came from Asia. And Parisodactylans, as I told you guys, they actually evolved in the Americas um, 30 odd million years ago. So during the Cenozoic era, 26 million years ago, we had this great influx of mammals coming in from Asia. And likewise, we had some escapees out of Africa, not too many, pretty much the only ones that really got out of Africa were the Dussies and the elephants. All the others stayed behind, all the other ones that were quite small. Anyway, on that note, uh, we're going to call it a class, short and sweet. If you guys have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. And we can un, um, you can unmute yourselves, you can start the... the... All right, sure, uh, anybody? Yes, hi. hi. Um, I guess it's a bit unrelated, but I was wondering, since you brought up termites and ants, I know that um, that ants, a lot of, like the majority of them are female. I was wondering if termites, it's the same. Uh, no, it's, yes, this is going back a while. Can I, can we do a QA and a and I can actually answer that for question for you later? I've learned this. I just, I don't want to give you the wrong answer. So yeah. let me get back to you in a day or two. 
Uh, we can definitely do a QA, Q and A maybe on Wednesday night, and I'll, and I'll give you the facts on that. I, it's just escaping me right now. Uh, it's not the same okay, as. And that, I also wanted to know if you learn all this. Do you have textbooks or, or books that you read for? Because because that's very interesting. I just don't know how you where like where you learn it. If it's um, I don't know. Oh, yeah. Textbooks are good. Um, what I do as well, I will put up. Um, um, I'm quite happy to share my. I've got. I have a combination of, of um, printed textbooks and and ebooks. So I buy stuff online, and I also look for stuff that's out of publication because it's free. Uh, and you can get a lot of stuff that's older older prints that you can just quite happily pick up online for free. They just disperse them, and you just download them. And some of the information is out of date, but usually most of it's full. You know, it's fine. It's if it's two or three years old, it's not going to be that out of date. Um, and then, of course, Wikipedia um, is a, Wikipedia is a gold mine. It, there's so much to learn on Wikipedia. If you just need to look something up quickly, like shit, I forgot that. Let me just go look up on Wikipedia. Um, I wouldn't use it for reference and university material, but if you just quickly need to look up a fact, it's usually quite concise and it's usually on form. There are discrepancies, but um, it's always a good go-to. And then there's actually a website that I use for a lot of this called afrotherians.org. Um, for this particular Afrotherians. And then there's a lot of mammal groups and a lot of evolutionary groups that you can also subscribe to. But yeah, I mean, the, the learning never stops. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, cool. very, very no interesting. Worries. Yeah, we'll do a Q and A on Wednesday, just, just to answer that question about termites. Any other question? Uh, I have a question, Nick. I don't put the camera on. Um, is it uh, completely unrelated? Is is it true that Frankie and Tula Tula passed away? Yeah, we found her yesterday, unfortunately, um, on an isolated area on the reserve. She passed away. She's been dead for a couple of days, and we were all suspected as much. Um, yeah, it's sad that the matriarch of the reserve is gone, but uh, someone will step in to take over the shoes. But she's not young. She was 48, which is 48 in human years, effectively, because they have a similar lifespan to humans um you know in the wild they live to 65 and humans in the wild typically live no later than 65 in fact earlier usually um so yeah that's unfortunate but these things happen i mean i'm sad but it's not going to change it and there's so many other things to go going on that you know i i am sad but um there's a lot of positivity we're getting cheetahs on the reserve we're getting new rhinos we're getting all sorts of things happening so i don't always look at the negatives mm -hmm. as well as the positives but yeah she passed away it's it's official um it's not not um a secret anymore but we only found out conclusively yesterday but we had suspected for about a week okay thank yeah, you it is sad um on the topic of afrotherians there she is other questions guys I have another one. Did you read the book by Eugene Murray on uh, um, the termite? The Soul of the White Ant. I've got it. Yes, I always wanted to read it. I wanted to find out. I don't know if anybody in the group maybe or you have read it. Um, think, is, do you recommend I it? I think I've got an e-copy as well, Suzanne. Uh, I've got an, a digital copy. I'll see if I do. Uh, and then on, on uh, Wednesday, if we do a q and I'll just send it in the group or send it to you by email or something like that. Okay. I think I've got a digital copy mm -hmm. as well. Um, and did you like it? It's very out of date. It's very, I mean, it was written like what, 70, 80 years ago. So it's it's a very good book. And by a poet, uh, you know, a guy who's not a formal academic, uh, you know, it's a very good book for what it is. It's actually excellent. I mean, this and what I love is that to see citizen science, you don't have to be some pompous PhD carrying guy, not to put a poop on anyone who's got a PhD, but um, it doesn't always have to be this little enclave of secret knowledge that you have to subscribe to a university to be an academic. You can be a Joe Soap or the door, you know, and decide to go and do something. Uh, I mean, Jan Smuts himself, you know, one is one of the greatest experts on African grasses, and he was a freaking lawyer and, and uh, a general, but he decided to take up grasses yeah. as a hobby, and he became one of the foremost experts on grasses. Okay. So, yeah, uh, to answer that question. Wow. Yeah. Um, anything else, guys? No, yes, no. All right, if there's going to be no other q and I'm going to round it off tonight. Sure, thanks for joining. Suzanne, Lise, Tato, Johan, everyone else had logged off in the last few minutes. Thanks for having me, guys. Uh, I'll try to get it done every week, a lesson, but let's just say every second week. With my schedule at the moment, I'm just, 
pack pretty busy. I'm loving the fact mm -hmm. that I've got a new computer, but um, it's amazing. But I think there's some compatibility issues with the, the, the um, PDFs that I've made because some of the pictures are just not showing. I don't know why, they're just not. Um, so I have to figure that out and uh, before next class and uh, see what, what it does from then on. Cool guys. So I want to say auf Wiedersehen, adios, arrivederci, sayonara, sayonara, tot since. And if you have any questions, <laughs> If you have any questions for the Q and A, anything about wildlife, let's let's catch up with our Q and A. Um, okay, hi, Shira's mom. Um, yeah, so let's just do a nice Q and A and actually have some fun on Wednesday and just ask questions about stuff. It doesn't have to be a mammals; it can be anything. Cool. Okay. Thank cool, you very much. No worries, right, guys. Bye. Enjoy your evening. Cheers. Cheers. Bye. You too. Bye. Bye.